and this is 90 in alpha, and theta with the other angle, then theta has to be the other angle. If that doesn't make sense, then just memorize this. All right? This has to be theta. The one between the y-axis and the weight. Okay, now let's do our, our sum. So sum up the x forces in this picture, and what are they? Not as simple as before, but still not too bad. What's the first fairly easy one that we see in the x? Tension, right? So the tension is this way, which is positive. Now, there's no x component for the normal force at all, right? Like right on the y-axis. But does the weight have an x component? Look, it's at an angle. So if I make this my hypotenuse, and this is my theta, this is the opposite side, isn't it? And it's also in the x direction. So how do I get, if it's the opposite side, how do I get it from the mg? I use so katoa. Opposite is associated with sine. Kato is associated with adjacent. This is opposite, so I need sine. Um, I don't want t sine theta. I want t minus m1g sine theta. Why did I put minus? Because the x component goes down. Now, when I add those all together by Newton's second law, what does that have to equal? The sum of all the external forces equals MA. Is it positive or negative based on our choice? We said this is going to go down, so this has to go up, so it's going to be positive. Everybody good with that? So that's, that's one of my equations right there. On this one, this one's very simple. I only have two. They're both in the Y. So I get T minus M2G equals... Negative m28, it has to because we know it's going to be falling. So it is going to be accelerating. So it's going to be negative m28. Why negative? Because it's going to be going down. Are we having fun yet? No. I don't like honesty. Different answer to this. I don't. Alright. So, alright, let's start with the Really, guys, it's not too bad. It's not as simple as it was last time. But I have this equation, T minus M1G sine theta equals M1A, and I have T minus M2G equals minus M2A. Now, I have A in both equations, and I have T in both equations. In, in algebra, you learn if you have two equations with two unknowns, we can still solve. One way is by substitution, and one way is by simultaneous equations. Usually in physics, substitution is faster. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for t. I'm going to say t is equal to m2g minus m2a. All right, so I just isolated my t. I'm going to take that expression and put it in here. See what I'm doing? Lots of, lots of circles and arrows. I took this and I rewrote it as t equals positive m2g, because I moved to this side, still negative m2a. And with that expression, that's what t equals. Well, this is also t, so I just put this in up here. So that takes me to m2g minus m2a minus m1g sine theta equals m1a. All right, everybody see that equation? Okay. This is t. I just wrote this equation. So there's my T, then minus M1G sine theta, and M1A. Right faster. Can you just substitute T, right? Exactly. So I took the second equation, and I found the expression for T, and I substituted it in for the T. And now the only unknown that's left is A, and I can just do algebra and solve for it. by the looks on everybody's face. Honest, it sinks in at some point and you'll wonder why it was hard. But I also realized the first time through it's like, what language is he speaking? It's not English. Um, all right, so 
How do I solve? Yeah, go ahead. Um, why are we using sine? I mean, why are we using sine and not? Why did we use sine and not cosine? Yeah. All right. So if we take a look at this picture, this is where my theta is, and I'm summing the x forces. Oh, and I never did sum the y forces, but it turns out we don't need them. So the y forces is n minus m1g sine. But that equals zero. All right. So it's for this reason. If you look. When I look at this thing here, this part that's parallel to the x-axis is this one, which is opposite my angle, and sine is what gives me the opposite side. In other words, m1g times the sine is what gives me this side. m1g times the cosine is what gives me this side. So that would probably be n minus m1g, excuse me, cosine, cosine, or sine. It's backwards from what you're thinking, because normally x is associated with cosine, isn't it? I mean, it, 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 it normally is when we do something like this. The x one is the cosine and the opposite one is the sine. But it's because my angle is with respect to the y-axis, not with respect to the x-axis. That's, that's what changes it all around. Normally when we're doing this, we're taking our angle relative to the x-axis. And this one, my angle is measured with respect to the y-axis. And that's what flips it from sine to cosine. If I say so. Do um, you remember the Sokotoa thing? Yeah. All right. So the whole thing is, this is my opposite. So my M1G is my hypotenuse. I want the opposite. The only way I can get it is a sine. Cosine would give me adjacent. Tangent would give me something I don't want at all. That's the only, I don't know a better answer to give you than just that. OK. All right. So at this point, then, we get everything with M1, I mean, with A on the same side. So I know this is backwards from what they teach in math, but I've already got a positive one over here. I'm going to bring this one over to this side. So m2g and minus m1g sine theta equals m2a plus m1a. Do you see what I did? I just took this term and I brought it over to this side. And so the negative m2g, I mean that negative m2a being positive. Now, I take this and I say a times m1 plus m2 equals m2g minus, actually let me do this, m2 minus m1 sine theta times g. And then all I did there when I brought this over is I just um, factored the g out. So the g's out here, so I get m2 minus m1 sine theta and I brought this over back to the A out, and I have M1 plus M2. So final line is M2 minus M1 sine theta all over M1 plus M2. OK, let's look at a couple things here and see if we're happy. I, mean, I already know nobody's happy, but that's OK. In the denominator, what do I hope to find? What did I tell you earlier in the class? What should I always look for? The sum of all the masses. Do I have that? Yes. So even if it's wrong, it's not entirely wrong. So I feel a little good about that. I can't have a subtraction in the denominator. I can't have the numerator, but I can't in the denominator. The denominator needs to be the sum of the masses. The other thing is, I should have units of acceleration. And g is an acceleration. So whatever the units are in the numerator, I need the same units in the denominator. And I've got mass, 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 mass. Ah, good. I mentioned that this will, all those units will cancel. So that's looking favorable. All right. So. I'm going to write this, and then there is a punchline to all this, believe it or not. Okay. Can I erase some of this? All right, so here's the thing. We did three different experiments. But I want to prove to you that this is the same as these two. If I have the very first one, where I've got, um, if this angle is theta, and I keep raising this up, does theta get bigger or smaller? OK, let's do here. So theta is this angle. So if I'm here, and I begin to move it up, what happens to theta? Smaller, and when I get up here, what does theta become? Zero. Zero. 
So in the case of this, I should have the same thing I just did except for theta should go to zero. So if I look at this, what happens when sigma theta goes to zero? What's sine of zero? Zero. So I should get m2 over m1 plus m2, bingo. Right? It worked. On the other hand, if I have this situation and I bring it all the way down so that all I have is a pulley with masses hanging on either side, what does theta go to? I mean, so I'm going this way, theta is getting bigger, 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 and when I get to the bottom, what's theta? 90. What's sine of 90? 1. So I say m1 sine of 90 is 1, so I have m1, m2 minus m1 over, I'm bingo, it takes me back to the Atlas machine. So this answer gives me both of those in the limit of small angle or big angle, which is kind of cool. All right? Because what we just learned is in science, if it doesn't work at the limits, you get it wrong. It has to be consistent because if your model is going to work, it has to match what's really going to happen. And if we already found out that this is really going to happen, then this one's got to get the same answer with theta changes to the extremes of 90 or 0. And it does, which is really quite cool. All right, or at least easy for me to say. It'll be cool to you someday, too, or not. All right. Um, Okay, any, <laughs> I don't know right here. any questions? Do I need to run from the room? Um, I, guys, I'm totally aware that that is like open your mouth and pour a couple gallons. Um, but so I'm, at this point I need to get up here. Are there questions about any part of the steps of deriving? Highly, highly recommend that you take some time and try to derive these yourself without looking at my notes. Because it'll make you, if not able to do it, you'll know how to ask me a very focused question. If you don't practice this and you don't have questions for me on Wednesday, then it's on your own heads if there's something on the test you can't do. I don't expect you to be able to take the test today, but I expect you to have good questions next week to make sure you can take the test. All right? But you have to, you have to practice on this. By the way, I have, you know, some of you don't have lives where you can actually do this, but I, I am not a person who says, now you've got a long weekend, work all day. Find one day and play. Play is an important part of learning. Your brain needs to take a vacation in order to absorb stuff. If you work nonstop, you'll fry and you won't, you won't absorb. Now, most of you are not going to have any trouble finding time to play, right? So I probably don't need you to encourage that too much. So, all right. If there are no questions, you realize I'm going to keep going if you don't stop me. So, we're going to go on. The reason I wanted to do all three was number one, they looked a little different and I wanted to get very used to how do I approach the problem. I can use free body diagrams of any masses involved. I can use Newton's second law. I choose my coordinate system so the acceleration is in one dimension. And I did choose them so because even though they look different, at the end we found out it's really all the same thing. All right? We found out we have the sum of the mass in the bottom, every single one of them. They look a little different on the top, but these two are the extreme cases. So for the test, you're going to want us to show all this work that led us to A. I don't know that I put this necessarily on the test this way. When we do the Atwood machine, just do the Atwood machine. Okay. Don't give me don't give me the extreme cases. There's, you don't have time. Does number three only apply to situations where we have the incline or decline? Yes. In other words, so it's for any theta between zero and nine. If theta is zero, we've got case one. If theta is nine, we get case two. All other cases would be case three. And Again, as I said, oh, by the way, what if, does it make sense to you that I can take an incline, if I have two different masses, I can find an incline for which the blocks will sit still, as long as M2 is bigger than M1? Hello world, right? I could find an angle for which, how would I find that angle just by looking at this? If the blocks were sitting still, what would A be? So just set A equal to zero, and, you, and all the masses are known, you could solve for the angle that that will occur for. They would be the only unknown in that equation. Cool stuff. In fact, it's it's literally just as easy as saying all I need is the numerator. M two minus M one sine theta has to equal zero. Just go from there. Sine theta has to equal M two over M one, so just take the arc cosine, which is why M one had to be bigger. So I have to, that's just telling you you can't have it the other way because you can't take an arc sine of a number bigger than one. If none of that made sense, it's cool. It all right. Um, now. Friction. There's two flavors of friction. 
one of them creates an inequality which is always confusing to people. Um, and so we're going to try to talk our way through that to make sure that it at least makes sense before you go home for the day. It may not still make sense by Monday, but by today. So, and friction, in two cases are static friction and kinetic friction. What do we associate kinetic with? Movement. Movement. But be very, very careful. So static is no relative movement. And kinetic is surface slide. Or relative. I'm walking. Clearly there's friction between my shoes and the floor, right? Mm -hmm. Which one of those is it? Is it static friction or kinetic friction? Mm -hmm. Which everybody says, but I'm not Michael Jackson and I'm not going whatever. Alright? Not even try to moonwalk. But you know what I'm saying is, my feet aren't sliding on the floor. You hear what I'm saying? When I walk, watch my feet. They don't slide on the floor at all. They stay planted. That's static. So only if you hear scuffing sounds am I using kinetic. So relative motion, there's no relative motion between my foot and the floor when I walk. Driving your car on the highway, static or kinetic? Static. Stat static because your tires aren't sliding. If your tires were sliding, you'd hear it and lay rubber down. So if you do slam on the brakes and you skid to a stop, kinetic. So the two surfaces have to move compared to each other. But when a car is driving and the tires are not sliding on the road, the point of contact of the tire is always stationary with the road. I know it's weird. So don't confuse it. Friction doesn't mean that it's kinetic if the thing is moving. It's kinetic if the surfaces in contact slide. That's important. All right. Now, the next thing that makes life interesting is that static friction is ugly. How's that? Uh, that's definitely uh, kinetic. Good. Roller skating, static. Snowboarding, ice skating, kinetic. All right. So here's the thing: when the book is flat, we don't expect the chalk to move because there's there's no gravity pull straight down, and there's no x component to it. But when I start to lift it up, there now is. Although the weight is down, there's this incline, which I just uh, raised, but you remember we say there's a component of the weight that's down the plane and a component of the weight that's perpendicular to the plane. Now, what that tells me is that for small angles, the component down the plane is small. As I make the angle bigger, the component down the plane gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but the chalk still isn't moving. So what can you say about the friction force here compared to the friction force here? It has to be greater. Why? Because it's a bigger pull down, right? And it's still sitting still. Does everybody get that? As I make this steeper and steeper, if you're on a mountain, as opposed to a flat road, and the mountain gets really steep, there's a bigger chance for you to fall, right? So the thing is, on a, on a steep slope, there's a, there's a bigger and bigger chance because the, the component down the slope is getting bigger. Remember, it goes as sine theta, and as theta gets bigger, sine theta gets bigger. Right? Sine theta starts at 0 for 0 degrees and goes all the way up to 1 by 90 degrees. So sine theta just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and that's the component. So all of that is static, which means that the equation we have for static friction is that static friction force is um, less than or equal to some coefficient, which we call mu sub s, times the normal force. Normal force is what gives rise to, to the friction force. So what this says is that just because you have a normal force and a coefficient of friction, that doesn't mean that's what you've got as a friction force. It'll, it's, that's the biggest it could be, but it could be this. In fact, it could be zero. So the chalk sitting on the book right now, is there a normal force on the book from the chalk? Yeah. And there's a normal force on the book. I mean, chalk on the book, but we're looking at the chalk. Is there a coefficient of friction between the two of them? Yeah, so any two surfaces that touch, there's a coefficient of friction between those two surfaces. So this is definitely a non-zero number. But the static friction at this moment on the chalk is zero because it's not trying to move. So 
That's the problem with saturation, is action inequality. So what we have to do is, we, if we want to find the second friction, we need other information in the problem that tells me what it needs to be. I can't get it from just doing this. Does that make sense? Look, here's what I want you to think. All surfaces are inherently rough. They're not really smooth. So my fingers are like the, the molecules in two surfaces. When they touch, those two surfaces interlock a little bit. When I start tipping the side, they try to slide, but they get hooked on the bumps. But if I turn it up, the, put, the pressure's enough that it breaks the bumps off and things slides down. That's why friction works things out. It always involves breaking off pieces of the surface. All right, so anything that rubs long enough eventually wears out. That's why you have to put oil in your engine and what's that? Because those parts, the pistons that move up and down, blah, 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 all the moving parts, if they didn't have oil in there, um, they would wear out very quickly. What the oil does is it floats the surfaces apart from each other so they can move without interlocking as deeply. There is still wear, but nowhere near as much. But anytime we have friction, it's because it's interlocking. But if they're like this and I'm sitting flat, is there a friction force? No, because they're not trying to slide. As soon as I start to tilt, there's a bit of a force trying to bump. And if I make it steep enough, that force that tries to bump is big enough to break off the pieces. All right, And that's why it depends on the normal force. Because the normal force, if the normal force is little, it's here. If the normal force is big, it's here. The normal force is how hard the surfaces push into each other. So a really big normal force makes it so it's really hard to slide because the bumps that interlock. Where a, a very small normal force means there's just tiny little bumps and I can easily slide past them. Is that making little sense? It's amusing. I'm sorry, it's amusing to be on this side of the desk. Yeah, that makes sense. Whatever you say, just let you go. Um, it's, I, I, I totally understand, but we, we do have to keep plowing. All right, so on kinetic, the good news is once we start breaking those bumps, it, that means the force has been established so that they're going to get broken, and there's enough of a force to do it, then it's just a constant. And so for this, the kinetic friction just equals the kinetic coefficient times the normal force. So this little symbol here is a mu. Um, apparently they don't teach this kind of stuff. Do you all know what I mean by a descender in terms of writing? So they don't teach this in first grade anymore. Um, we used to have paper when I was in first grade that went like this. And we were to write letters that went up to here, but then we had letters that had descenders, meaning they go below the line. They would, you know, they would have us match up. All right. So mu is a descender. If I'm going to write mu, if you want to write it properly, that's how it should look. It comes up with a stroke, and then you write the letter u. So it comes up with a big stroke below the line, and then you write the letter u. All right. And that's mu. It's what we use for the coefficient of friction. For kinetic friction, that tells me that the normal force times this number that has to be given to you, you can't know it. It has to be measured in a lab, and there'll be a table that has these values that will equal the kinetic friction, and it doesn't matter how slow or how fast the object is moving once it starts to move. This one we can't know because it's somewhere between zero and some maximum. I was going to ask, what's the coefficient? What's the which? Uh, or like the... The units of... Oh. No, never mind. You said there was a table, right? Yes. How is that coefficient? Oh, so um, <clears throat> we actually used to try to do this in the lab, but we don't have enough, because we're having holidays and so many Mondays this semester, I didn't have time to do it. Basically, it's measured by... Um, sliding something across the surface and seeing how the part goes. I mean, no, if you know its initial velocity, see how long it takes to come to a stop. Now, in real fact, it turns out that friction is notoriously terrible to measure. So, if you look at this desktop, it, hopefully it's pretty clear to you that it's not it's not a uniform top at all. It's really hard to find surfaces where there's not bumps or uneven places or you know, crud. I don't know of a better word. Stuck in little places that change what your coefficient of friction is actually going to be. But your book will give you, uh, one of the highest coefficients of friction is fresh rubber on asphalt. That's one of the highest coefficients of friction that there is, which is a good thing. It's partly why we decided to make tires out of rubber, because you've got really good traction with that. All right. Um, ice, not so good. So any two surfaces would have coefficients of friction. Some things slide more easily than others. And it'll just depend on, on the particular materials involved. All right, so here's the thing that, one of the homework questions you have is that I have a refrigerator that has a mass of 80 kilograms, and it's sitting on a floor where the coefficient of static friction is equal to 0.6. And the question is, 
What? Actually, this isn't the question. Your author actually makes a mistake on this. I love when somebody besides me makes the mistake. Um, but he, he, he simply asks, what's the minimum force required to move this refrigerator? And you have to assume that it's horizontal. But in fact, horizontal isn't the right answer. Horizontal is the answer we're going to go for. But I want you to realize that your own instinct, anybody in the room, if you've got a heavy object in the room and someone asks you to move it, what do you do when you grab hold of it? You lift a little, don't you? All right, and that's because it turns out that a very small angle actually decreases the amount of force you need to move something. But your answer in the answer book assumed that there was no lifting involved. So we'll go with that. Um, and the, and the uh, angle at which you get maximum varies somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees. So it's not a very big angle. But we'll just go with this. Now, even though it's a refrigerator, it's a point object. What we want to find is we want to apply a force that will actually make this move. Help me draw the remaining forces on acting on this refrigerator. Remember, although it's the refrigerator is really a point object, I heard weight. So we're going to have mg weight, normal force, and friction. And I'm giving you static. Why do you think I'm doing static friction instead of kinetic? I'm trying to move it. Because until I move it, it's static, right? So that's what's going to fight me. Static friction fights me. Once it starts to move, it goes kinetic. But I want to find the force I need to get it started. Now, in general, this is true. For the same two surfaces, the static friction is larger than the kinetic friction. Let's prove it. Watch the box of chalk. Static, 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 static. What happened when it went kinetic? It didn't just start moving a little, it took off. That's because once it gets past the static and drops to kinetic, kinetic is smaller, so it, it just takes off. Driving. If you're uh, breaking an emergency, is skidding a good plan? You all have heard this, right? Don't skid. Now, of course, none of you, you're all too young, keep forgetting. Every car has anti-skid brakes because people are fools. And so they had to build it into the car. Because if you skid, you're going to hit it. But if you can control your braking so you don't skid, you'll come to a stop faster. That's because kinetic friction is lower. So if you start to skid, you're going to have to go further. If you can keep it so the tires don't slide, you'll stop faster. Okay? So we've got this picture. What do I need to solve the problem? I want to find this force that makes it move. What do I need to do to solve the problem? Based on this is what I need. All right. I'm going to need to find the normal force. So I say the sum of the x or y forces. I'm doing normal force. So the sum of y forces equals n minus mg equals 0. All right? So that tells me n is equal to mg in this case. Cool. Now I do the x forces. Sum of x forces, what do I have here? F minus script s sub s. All right? So the applied force minus the friction force. So instead of writing this, I'm going to write this. OK. This is an inequality. Why am I, setting, why am I using the whole thing? Why am I setting it equal? Because I want it to move. So I've got to get up to its maximum value it can give, and then just a little more. right? So I need to be able to completely get past the friction force. So I need to pull the force that's just a, you know, a microscopic bit bigger than this force. So I want, I'm on the wrong equation, I want this, I want the equal sign. Because anything less than that force will never move it. So when I at least equal this, then a little nudge more will start it. That's why we do this. That's why we can put this here. All right, so the sum of the x forces, I've got the applied, I've got the friction force, and this should also equal zero because we're not going to. We're not going to actually accelerate. We're just going to try to get started. So we're right at the point where even a mosquito breathing on it will move it. All right. So just a little more, and it would go. All right. But I know what n is. So this says f minus um, mu sub s n, but n is equal to mg. Um, it is equal to zero. So at this point, they they gave me. Um, a coefficient of 0.6. I've got A for M, G is well known. I can solve for F, and that's the force they're looking for that will actually make this move. 
it's actually the force, it, strictly speaking, this force wouldn't make it move, but literally it's such on the brink that just anything a tiny bit more, and, and, and I mean, the most smallest amount more that you can think of, it would start. Yes? Uh, can you explain why again the uh, effects was there? Uh, the, because we don't actually want it to accelerate, we just want to get it started to move, we just want to get up to that point where anything bigger than that will make it move. If I don't make it to zero, if I make this an inequality, I don't have any way to finish solving the problem. So it's a good question. In other words, what this is, is the biggest it can be without moving. Anything more than that will move it. And so we kind of claim that's the solution. All right, so guys, any question on any part of that? So the main things are, if we have kinetic friction, just look up the coefficient in the book or wherever, you know, and solve this way. If it's static, you have to first analyze, is it going to move? And if not, then the static friction force just equals whatever the other force is. We'll talk more about this on Wednesday. Tragically, you're going to have to do Monday on your own. Have barbecues or something. I know that's going to be a pain. But, uh,